Hello everyone, I'm Stefan Tavenik, and today I would like to talk to you about efficiency limits for Lambertian spectrum splitting in two terminal perovskite silicon tandem solar cells. First of all, I would, would really like to thank Verena Neda, who did most of this work as part of her PhD thesis. And I'd also like to thank the Photonic Materials Group and my supervisor, Albert Polman. Now to begin with, why perovskite silicon tandems? Well, first of all, um, they're based on two of the best well uh, investigated absorbers that we currently have. So silicon and perovskite, and together they form really the commercially most relevant tandem that we have to date. If you look here at the um, famous NREL graph and um, at the emerging technologies, you see here in blue with uh, blue and orange triangles, um, the trajectory of uh, perovskite silicon tandems, and you see that it's really well on its way to surpass the 30% limit by the end of next year. We just had a new record actually two weeks ago. And um, to get beyond this 30%, there's still some work to do. And we think we've identified uh, one path towards getting beyond those 30% by using spectrum splitting. So first of all, um, what's the issue? Perovskite uh, top cells are not perfectly absorbing. And hence, if you look at the AM1.5G uh, spectrum here in black, you can see that the red part is absorbed in the silicon solar cell. Then here in dash line, you have the bank of the perovskite, and the blue part is absorbed in a perovskite. You also see that you don't perfectly absorb until the band gap, but you have some difference between the AM1.5 G spectrum and what the perovskite absorbs. And this, this is basically imperfect absorption in a perovskite, which will create a current mismatch. And you always have to basically then uh, fix this by going to thicker or thinner perovskites, depending on your uh, top cell band gap. And that's not ideal because that could introduce electronic losses because you have to go to really thick uh, uh, cells maybe. And also um, if you have to make them thicker, it becomes financially more expensive. <clears throat> so what we're suggesting is to introduce a spectrum splitting layer at the interface between the perovskite and the silicon um, solar cell to have light bounce back when it's above the band gap and be transmitted when its um, wavelength is below the band gap. And you can do this in two different fashions, in a planar or a Lambertian fashion, which I'll talk about later. So we investigated the possibilities of these um, concepts by doing detailed balance calculations. And just as a quick reminder, detailed balance cal calculations require uh, are based on these three equations, where you have your recombination current, which is a function of your band gap and the voltage, and then your generation current, which mainly depends on your incident spectrum and the band gap. And then together, the difference gives you an IV curve for a specific bandwidth. And um, basically, if you want to apply this to a tandem solar cell, you generate those two IV curves and then put them in series and force the current matching condition. And then you can generate a tandem IV curve from those two individual IV curves. And we did this and looked at a couple of different ways of using this limit. And that's what you can see here. So first of all, we started by just strictly um, considering the assumptions in the detail balance, so perfect absorption in both layers. And that gives you this blue limit that peaks here around 1.7, 1.75. And um, this gives you the overall highest efficiency that you can get. And you see that for top cell, uh, for perovskite top cell band gaps that are higher than that, you will also um, always be limited by this limit. However, if you go lower in band gap, you see that there's actually a different limit that gives you higher values. That's the current splitting limit. And this one basically relaxes the detail balance conditions a little bit in the sense that it allows for non-perfect absorption in the top cell to achieve current matching by letting light pass through into the limiting bottom cell. And that helps you if you go to lower uh, top cell band gaps. And then a third limit is the semi-transparent top cell limit where basically we took into account a realistic um, absorption coefficient for perovskites, and we shifted this to different band gaps to be able to um, check the full range. And we also did this then for realistic thicknesses, right? <clears throat> and if you look then at these uh, colorful uh, plots that uh, correspond to that limit, you see that basically the highest values, um, the thinner the, the perovskite, the lower the peak efficiency, or the lower the band gap for the peak efficiency. And then if you increase the thickness, then you slowly approach the thermodynamic limit, but you can see that the spacing here becomes smaller and smaller. So it's increasingly difficult to really 
get there for top cells that are um, or for band gaps that are beyond the ideal band gap. So what do you do if your periscite that you have is slightly too large in band gap for the ideal case? Well, that's when you introduce the spectrum splitter, as we said earlier. So now, basically, what we're suggesting is to use the spectrum splitter um, that has the following property. So it's at the interface between your periscite and silicon, and it reflects nothing if the wavelength of uh, interest is be, um, above a certain threshold uh, wavelength, which is usually around the band gap. And it reflects a certain amount if your wavelength is smaller than the threshold wavelength. <clears throat> Furthermore, this will give you a path length enhancement for the light that is scattered back into the top cell. And this path length enhancement is either factor two, like in this case, or it's beyond the factor two, like in the Lambertian case that you can see here. Now, if you then collect uh, at those limits to what we saw earlier, you get the graph that you can see here on the right. Where we basically, um, as a function of wavelength, again, looked at the efficiency. And um, I'd like to first start with the red line here, which corresponds to a 500 nanometer thick top cell um, on your silicon without any spectrum splitting yet. And here in the top cell range, you can see the efficiency is fairly low, say around 35%, compared to 43% that you could reach in the thermodynamic limit, um, just due to the imperfect absorption in these 500 nanometer perovskite. So what you can do is, um, and what people frequently do then is um, say that they, okay, let's increase the thickness of the perovskite. And so if you do this by factor two, you reach the 1000 nanometer um, TTC limit, which is the same, just twice as thick. And okay, you already won. But we, what you can also do instead is basically keep the thickness at 500 nanometers and add this planar uh, spectrum, spectrum splitter. And if that has reflection of unity, then basically you will approach the same as the 1000 nanometer TTC limit. So you also doubled the path length in your um, top cell. And you can do even better if you introduce a Lambertian spectrum splitter by using um, some scattering objects. And then you really um, could go slightly better and are slowly approaching the thermodynamic limit. So we can, can win a lot without having to make our perovskite figure. That's already interesting in itself. And there's more parameters to look at when we consider this, because um, you, can, you don't necessarily have to have the onset of your reflection right at the band gap, and you don't necessarily have to have unity reflection. Now, to begin with, um, we can analyze um, here the onset of your, uh, of your reflection and um, zero would be basically at the band gap and then all the other values is slightly above or slightly below the band gap and here you have the reflection value that you need and what you can see here is that basically for a band gap this all is for a band gap of 1.7 electron volts for the top cell then really you achieve the highest increase in efficiency by basically having unity reflection by perfectly reflecting above the band gap or above this threshold and the threshold is actually 20 millielectron electron volts above the periscite band gap. So it's slightly shifted. And now you might say, okay, it makes total sense that reflection should be really high, but that's only the case for this specific band gap. We can also look at um, this nuance for different band gaps, which we're doing here. So again, here you have reflection and here you have the different band gaps for the top cell. And you can see that here around 1.65, you really have an inversion of behavior to the right you see that it's in general ideal to have high reflectivities um, because there your top cell is limiting and you want to scatter a lot of light back. But to the left, you can see that basically high reflectivities would make it worse. So if you would have a um, low band gap and bottom cell, uh, top cell, you would suffer a little bit. <clears throat> Furthermore, there's also an interesting trend to see at reflectivities below 0 0.1 because there actually this behavior is inverted and low reflectivities are really handy below a band gap of um, say 1.6. And this is due to the fact that this whole uh, figure is basically based on a re um, reference to the reflection that you get at an ordinary silicon periscite interface, which is around 10%. And for bottom cells, this means, or for, for um, low band gap top cells, this means that you actually lose some current that you really need in your bottom cell. And by lowering the reflection, say with an AR coding at the interface, you could also win in this region by up to 2% as you see. Well, um, that's already two important parameters 
one maybe more uh, important parameter for realization later on is the parasitic absorption, which we want to look at now. Here you can see basically uh, the potential uh, efficiency gain as a function of parasitic absorption. And what you can clearly observe is that we have uh, change independence um, with basically two kind of slopes, a steep slope and also like a more shallow slope. And this really depends on which top cell or which, which cell is limiting in your um, tandem device because um, parasitic absorption only affects light that passes all the way through the parasite to the silicon parasite interface. So the first pass through the parasite is not affected by parasitic absorption, which, mean, which means that it affects the top cell less than it does the bottom cell because all the light that enters the bottom cell will be affected by parasitic absorption. <clears throat> and that means that basically you have a steep slope, slope when your bottom cell is current limiting, whereas you have a shallow slope at times when your top cell is current limiting. <clears throat> Furthermore, if you look also at the numbers, you can see that even for a uh, parasitic absorption of 10%, you can really gain up to 3% uh, in efficiency according to detailed balance, which is quite significant considering that 10% parasitic absorption is a lot. <clears throat> now, knowing this, does this mean um, that this is promising for fabrication? Um, I would say the parasitic absorption argument definitely, but there's still some other hurdles to tackle. First of all, um, the refractive index contrast. First of all, you need to achieve a refractive index contrast uh, to get this spectrum splitting behavior. There's a couple of ways how you can do this. Um, either you reshape whatever you have at the interface already, or you introduce electronically inert materials which do the job for you. <clears throat> and just to show you one approach is basically to create these kind of uh, periodic patterns of some nano elements of say, these are roughly um, dimensions of 117 nanometers, um, which was done for four terminal spectrum splitter by Verena. And um, this layer performed fairly well. If you look, look here, that's um, what simulations uh, predict for its performance. You basically would have a really sharp absorption onset jumping all the way to 0 0.4 uh, to 40% reflect reflectance. And then you go even on to 0.8. And such a nice um, onset of reflection, such, such a nice spectrum splitting behavior would gain you two to 3% um, efficiency. Now, introducing this into, the, into a two terminal device um, is a bit tricky to get the refractive index contrast and stuff, but one avenue you could explore is basically to take your silicon and then um, pattern one material that's fairly inert or is actually even part of the um, interface range uh, between perovskite and silicon and for example, pattern holes into it, like we did here for silicon dioxide nanoparticles. And then you could infiltrate these holes with say the perovskite, and you basically have pattern perovskite that by changing the dimensions could act as a resonator to scatter light back um, in the desired fashion. And um, yes, with this, I'd like to conclude and remind you um, about the main lessons that we learned. So strictly according to detail balance, the efficiency gains that are possible for um, top cells with a slightly larger band gap than the ideal one is 5%. Then realistic efficiency gains, um, basically by, by, uh, by accounting for the current uh, record efficiencies um, that we have for tandems, would be in the range between two to 3%, so still fairly significant. And if you then also include parasitic absorption of say 10%, which is fairly generous, you would be in the range of 1.5 to 2% uh, potential gains. And um, that definitely would push us um, across the, would push us across the 30% um, barrier um, that we find ourselves at, at the moment. And I'd also like to really highlight again that this is works best, kind of around the ideal band gap, but also for band gaps that are um, larger than that actually it becomes increasingly, increasingly beneficial for these cases. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.